Hello and welcome. So glad that you could join us today. This morning we are going to be in Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, Genesis chapter 8. I hope that you join us each and every week. You've got your Bibles in hand, perhaps a pen and a pad of paper close by, and you can jot down notes, jot down items of interest that you may want to look up on your own. If you have any questions, post those in the comments section of this video. Genesis chapter 8. You know, the story of Noah is very exciting till you get to Genesis chapter 7. At that point, the story seems to get bogged down in details. Now, some of those details are interesting. I mean, there's information in Genesis chapter 7 about all the various animals brought on board and it also has a very specific accounting re regarding the precise dates when certain events relating to the flood took place. And it's sort of just easy to skim over uh, Genesis chapter 7 and 8 in order to resume the action in Genesis chapter 9. But I think that would be a huge mistake. For one thing, it's hard to imagine any action greater than a worldwide flood. These details are placed in the Bible for a reason. You know, the Lord wants us to know what happened, how it happened, step by step. Now, here's just a few interesting details that we read out of Genesis chapter 7. We read that Noah and his family entered the ark seven days before the rains began to fall. And we also learned that the rain fell for 40 days and 40 nights. We also learned that the flood covered the earth for 150 days. 74 days later, the tops of the mountains became visible. Noah was 601 years, 2 months, and 27 days old when he left the ark. Now, if you add it all up, Noah spent one year and 17 days in the ark. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a long time in a cramped space with lots and lots of animals and family. <laughs> I mean, this was no luxury cruise. The ark was not equipped with a swimming pool. There were no movies, no entertainers, no fancy buffets. There was nothing to do but stay in the boat while it floated aimlessly on the surface of the ocean. It was no picnic being on the ark. Now, the Bible does not tell us anything about Noah's personal emotions during that long time he spent in the ark. We know that he was a man of faith who took God at his word. That's why he built the ark in the first place. But he was also a human. And the sea is a lonely place. It could not have been easy to have been shut up inside the ark with his family and all those various animals. I wonder if he ever thought if God had forgotten him. I couldn't blame him if he had his doubts. I mean, he had done what God had told him. He had preached to an unbelieving world. He had built this enormous ark. He led the animals two by two into the ark. And then he entered in with his own family. And now he's in this giant boat bobbing up and down with the waves. And one day fades into the next. He cannot see the sun because of the cloud cover. There is no course to follow, just drifting on the surface of the endless, endless ocean. Have you ever felt abandoned by God? Have you ever wondered if God has just forgotten about you? Have you ever felt as if your prayers were 
bouncing off the ceiling and hitting you on the head? If so, Genesis chapter 8 is for you. The message of the chapter is given for us in verse number 1. Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. Now just consider that simple phrase, God remembered Noah. Those three words tell us a great deal about the Lord. One of the greatest human fears is to be forgotten. We fear death because that ultimately we're going to be buried in a grave, and the whole world's going to go on without us, and we will eventually be forgotten. Now, if you doubt that, just visit an old graveyard and study the tombstones of those who were buried, some of them in the early 1800s. Who are they? Where did they come from? What were they like? What did they do? And the greatest question, does anyone today remember them? In most cases, the answer is no. And if you go back far enough, you can find thousands upon thousands of graves of forgotten people who lived and died, and it's as if they were never here at all. And when the text tells us that God remembered Noah, it doesn't mean that God had ever forgotten him in the first place. It simply means that in the midst of the great flood, God stayed true to his promises. He promised to deliver Noah and his families and all those animals. And during the flood, with all of its death and destruction, the Lord looked down on the earth and he remembered to have mercy on those eight people who were floating in that big barge with all those animals. Now, perhaps Noah felt forgotten by God. If so, he's in good company because the greatest saints of the ages have felt the same way at one time or another. One man wrote of the dark night of the soul when he felt completely alone and abandoned by God. The Psalms are filled with similar statements. Uh, in Psalm 42, verse 9, uh, David writes, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? And in the Lord Jesus, we have the supreme example of the righteous man feeling abandoned. In his darkest moments, as he hung on the cross, Jesus cried out those words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our text this morning contains an important message of hope, and that is, in the midst of judgment, God always remembers mercy. He remembers those who suffer, and he keeps his eyes on them. And though they suffer long and they often feel forgotten, Almighty God will not abandon them. As God remembered Noah, even so he will remember you and I. There is no trial so severe that it can separate us from the God who loves us. There are three ways in which the Lord remembered Noah in the flood. The first way, we read that God sent a wind. Genesis chapter 8 verse 1 is very specific on this point. God sent a wind that blew across the whole earth, and it caused those floodwaters to begin to recede. This speaks to God's authority over the forces of nature. He commanded the wind, and the wind blew. He said to those waters, settle down, 
and they settled down. At his command, the water level began to decrease around the globe. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 4 says that he holds the wind in his hands and he wraps the waters in his cloak. And according to Job chapter 38, he puts limits on the waves and says to them, Thus far and no farther you may go. Psalm 135 verse 7 tells us that he brings wind out of the storehouse of heaven. Every drop of water, every gust of wind, and every tiny snowflake comes from the hands of God. Even hurricanes and tornadoes serve his purposes. The storms that batter the earth are fully under his divine control. And just as God has the key to open, he also has the key to shut. He turned off the faucet, and the heavens dried up, and the water began to evaporate from the surface of the earth. We should learn from this, that when affliction has done its appointed work, it will be removed from us. Whether it be sickness, or ill fortune, or bad circumstances, or hateful opposition, or even truly bad weather, when God's purposes have been served, the hard times will go away. That's why I think my favorite Bible passages are the ones that begin with those words, and it came to pass. I'm thankful that no matter how bad things get, it'll come to pass. It is significant that the flood did not disappear in just a day. Those waters rose slowly, and they fell slowly. Even so, God usually works deliverance for us gradually, little by little, day by day, step by step. You know, we didn't get into trouble overnight, and we don't get out of trouble overnight either. Now, there's a second way that we read that God remembered Noah. And that is that God gave him a sign. In Genesis chapter 8, look at verse 6. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Then he set out a raven which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand, and he took her, and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth, and Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him any more. You see, Noah was looking for signs that the flood was coming to an end. I'm sure he was tired of being around those animals day and night. We can't even begin to imagine all the smells and the other aspects of living in that ark. No doubt, Noah was ready to see the family have a little bit of elbow room. It's not easy to dwell with your sons and your daughter-in-laws and your wife in close range for over a year. You can never get out of the house and you could never get far enough away that you were out of trouble for whatever you had done wrong. I'm sure that Noah was ready to get out of that ark. I'm sure he spent a, uh, some time in the doghouse. Well, the whole ark was a doghouse. So he sent out a raven, 
And since ravens feast on rotting flesh, it no doubt found plenty to eat on the surface of the ocean. It flew back and forth, but it did not return to the ark. The first time Noah ever sent out a dove, it came back because that water was not low enough. The second time the dove returned with an olive leaf, indicating that the trees were beginning to grow. The third time Noah sent out that dove, it didn't come back at all. Noah knew then that the end of the flood must be very near. But why did he send the birds in the first place? Well, the answer is pretty simple, and maybe it's easy for us to overlook. God had told him when the flood would start, but God did not tell Noah when the flood would end. And he needed to know the approximate date it would begin so he could get the ark built in time. But God never told him how long the flood would last because that was information Noah didn't need to know. Now, I think we can all relate to Noah's intention. We can endure almost anything if only we know when it will end. And that applies to sickness, to personal pain, to broken relationships, to trouble at work, to financial stress, or even watching our loved ones suffer. Whatever it is, we can take it if we know that two weeks from next Tuesday, our troubles are coming to an end. And often, it is the not knowing that wears us down. We watch and we wait and we wonder and we pray as the uncertainty gnaws away at us on the inside. And our chief question is always, when's this going to end? And the answer is always, in God's time, not one day sooner, not one day later. Nothing can rush or change or hinder God's designs for his children. And in our doubts and confusion, we can rest on this truth. God can make the dry ground appear any time he chooses. You know, we may feel forgotten and abandoned in the flood, but the dry land will appear in due time. I want you to notice also that Noah didn't get out of the ark for a long time, even after the first land had appeared. I think that after a whole year on that ark, I would have jumped over the side and started swimming for shore as soon as the first peak poked through the surface of the water. But Noah still had a lot of waiting to do. That should not surprise us. All of this is for our ultimate benefit. His answers are delayed in order that his sovereignty might be established. You know, he's God and we're not, and that our hearts might be humble, and to ensure that when that answer finally comes, God alone gets the glory. You know, in our haste, or our frustration or desperation, we may try to leave the ark too soon. We may try to unhinge the door, or climb out through the window, or even knock a hole in the side of the ark. But when we do, we slip and slide through the mud and we end up in the water. It's better that we should wait for God's answers to appear and to trust that our Heavenly Father will give us what we need when we need it. And just as God gave Noah a sign, he still gives signs and tokens of his grace today. You know, often it's a scripture or a song repeated at just the right moment or a phone call or a letter that came when we felt like giving up. You know, God does not always spare us the pain of life, but he gives us tokens, roses that bloom in the snow, 
to remind us that even in our sadness and in our despair, we are never alone, never forgotten. There's a third way that God remembered Noah, and that is God spoke to Noah again. Look in verse 13 of our text. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. You know, the final way that God remembered Noah was by speaking to him again. We see in these verses that God instructed Noah to leave the ark with his family and the animals. As far as we can tell, this is the first time that God had spoken to Noah since he told him to enter the ark. The year in between have been a time of silence from heaven. What a long year that must have been inside the ark, with that boat drifting aimlessly on the waters. And as Noah watched and waited, he went about his duties, wondering when the Lord would speak to him again. I mean, who could blame Noah if he had felt forgotten? The same thing could happen to any of us. You may come to a time in your life when you feel forgotten and alone. You may think that the heavens become as brass and that your prayers are bouncing back at you. You may lack the conscious sense of God's presence so that you feel abandoned and left to face life on your own. What do you do then? You need to do what Noah did. Stay faithful to what you know to be true. Obey the Lord and follow the light that he had given you in the past. Day after day, Noah had to get up and take care of his responsibilities. You know, it didn't matter if he felt like it or not. God had given him a job to do and it had to be done. He had to get up and feed those animals on a daily basis. There were things and responsibilities and chores he had to do, and he needed to stay faithful in doing them. His feelings didn't matter. He knew that God had led him this far, and he believed that God had his best interest at heart. While he waited for the Lord to speak again, he did the only thing that we could do. He remained faithful. Wait on the Lord, and while you wait, obey as much as you know. And when the time comes, God will speak to you again. You know, you cannot rush God. In his time, you'll hear his voice again. And until that day comes, just stay faithful. Do your duty. There's no reason to stay in bed and mope. Get up and do what needs to be done. And just as God spoke to Moses again, so he will speak to you in due time. Now, Genesis chapter 8 is primarily about God remembering Noah. But it also contains wonderful truth about how Noah remembered God. Our text reveals two specific ways in which Noah remembered the Lord. First of all, Noah left the ark. In verse 18, we read, So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. 
every animal, every creeping thing, every bird and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. Now, I don't think we appreciate how much courage it took for Noah to leave the ark. Now, I've already pointed out the ark must have been crowded, but it must have been cramped and no doubt somewhat smelly. But it's also been home and it was safe. Now they were leaving the known for the unknown. The world that they had known was gone forever. The city's gone, roads are gone, homes are gone. People are gone. Um, even geography has changed. All the landmarks are all different. Nothing looked the same. Everything was new. And it might have been easier for Noah just to stay in the ark, uncomfortable though it was. And so it took great courage to step out of the ark into this brand new world. It meant leaving behind safety and security. It meant trusting God for a totally unknown future. You know, sometimes, in fact, many times, God calls us to do things that are hard and may even seem impossible. We are called to leave the known for the unknown. And we have to leave the ark that's taken us this far and step out on our own. It's scary, it's unnerving, and it's harrowing because once we leave the familiar confines, we can never go back there again. To leave the ark meant embarking on a new life with new dangers and new opportunities. So it takes courage and resolve and a decision not to look back or to second guess yourself. Noah and his family came out first. That wasn't easy either. I mean, if it had been me, I think I would have sent out the tigers or the lions first. Maybe I would have slapped one of the elements on the rump and say, okay, big fella, get out there and take a look around. Noah led the way and his family followed. That took courage as well. If things went bad, he would have to deal with it. See, faith means taking the next step and then trusting God with the results. It's a paradox of life that even though the ark is smelly and cramped, we may be afraid to leave it because it represents the only security that we have ever known. Sometimes we pray for a change in our circumstances but when that moment comes, we're so overwhelmed with fear that we're paralyzed and unable to move. Perhaps we ought to add a verse, figuratively that is, to Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Noah built the ark. By faith, Noah entered the ark. By faith, Noah left the ark. That brings me to a good question for us just to think about a moment. Which was harder, to enter the ark or to leave it? You see, both can be difficult. Some of us are stuck because we know it's time to move forward, but we're afraid to take that first step. And God bless Noah, who knew when to get on the big boat but he also knew when to come off. We, we also see a second way that uh, Noah remembered God, and that is Noah built an altar. In verse 20, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, the sequence of events is very important. God tells Noah to leave the ark, and he leaves the ark. And the first thing he does after stepping on dry ground is to build an altar to the Lord. Now, not many folks would have done that as their first act 
after getting out of the ark. I can imagine most folks running from the ark, kicking up their heels and saying, let's go, let's get started. We've got a world to build. Time's a-wasting. Not Noah. His first act was to publicly thank God for his deliverance. Like the ten lepers who were cured by Jesus on only one return to give thanks, even so, when we often receive great blessings from the Lord, and in our haste to enjoy them, we seldom stop to say thank you. But Noah took the time to build an altar and make sacrifices to the Lord. That offering represented his complete surrender and total uh, uh, dedication to the Lord. After the flood, Noah could see that God was not only a God of wrath, but a God of mercy. Noah recognized that he owed everything to the Lord. It was God who had warned him. God who had told him to build the ark. God who designed the ark. God who called the animals to the ark two by two. God who shut the door. God who preserved the ark through the flood. God who brought the ark to a safe place. And it was God who told Noah when it was safe to leave the ark. God did it all. Noah, he was just along for the ride. You know, this is an Old Testament picture of salvation by grace alone. Noah added nothing to the equation. Even the strength and perseverance to build that ark came from God. Noah takes no credit, but by his offering signifies that God has delivered him and his family. His offering is a way of saying, By rights, I should have perished in that flood, but God in his mercy delivered me. What a challenge this is to all of us to remember God in all that we do. Ecclesiastes reminds us, remember your creator in the days of your youth. We are to remember God in our early days while we have the strength and the energy and all of life stretches out before us. We need to remember God. Jeremiah chapter 51 instructs us to remember the Lord in a distant land. You know, we uh, in the original setting, those words applied to the Jewish exiles that had been taken from their homeland in Judah and carried off into captivity in Babylon. They were now far away from home in a new culture surrounded by people who did not share their faith, facing every day the twin temptations of despair and compromise. How would they survive? Well, the answer was clear. Don't forget your God. Now is the time to remember God. Let this be your motto. I will remember the Lord. Take time to give thanks. Build an altar where you'll meet the Lord every day. Take time to pray. Speak up for Jesus. Bless the name of the Lord and do it publicly. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, I thank you for all those who have joined us today. I pray that you would bless them. And Lord, as we have gone through this familiar story, I pray that you would help each of us to remember the Lord. Father, give us strength and courage, but most of all, give us reminders of what you have done for us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. This Sunday, we are going to continue our series on the names of God that we see in the Bible. Uh, We are calling this series, What God Goes By, and we hope that you will join us. Next Wednesday, 
We continue our live online Bible study out of the book of Genesis. That's Wednesday mornings at 10.30 a.m. live on Facebook. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.